Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the DIM 400 Musculoskeletal System Lectures on Diagnostic Imaging of the Joints. I'm Dr. Cristela Rue, and I'll be presenting these lectures. First, we start off with a little bit of technique on how to radiograph the joints. As you can see in the image, tight collimation should be applied limited only to the joint, and this is important to decrease scatter. A grid may or may not be necessary. For larger structures, such as the stifle, shoulder, and pelvis, especially in large dogs, a grid would be necessary. It might not be necessary in the small breed dogs, and it's not needed for the carpus, the elbow, and the tarsus. It's important to center the beam in the middle of the joint. Again, I just want to emphasize the importance of taking two orthogonal views or two views at right angles to each other, as for any other structure or any other body part that we've discussed. Some special views can be applied, and we'll cover these when we look at each um, joint in that spe specific section. But for example, here is a cranioproximal to craniodistal oblique view or a skyline view of the patella, which highlights the patella itself, as well as the trochlear groove and the two trochlear ridges of the distal femur. Another technique that can be applied to joints, which is different from other body parts, is the stress radiograph. A stress radiograph means that an external stressor, usually ropes or ties, or sometimes even a wooden spoon or spatula, is pushed against or applied to the joint being studied. The purpose of this is to enable any palpable laxity to be demonstrated on a radiograph. For example, in the image here, the distal rope is pulling dorsally on the carpus, whereas the proximal rope is pulling in a palmar direction. So this would be a dorsopalmarly stressed view, but it is still a mediolateral view. This is an example of what it would look like. In, in, the, in extension, it looks pretty normal because there is very strong palmar support over the carpus. In flexion, the antibrachial joint can open up quite widely. And if in doubt as to whether a structure is normal or not, one can always apply flexion or extension or stress radiography to the opposite limb to compare. Here's another example of a mediolaterally stressed dorsal palmar view of the carpus. The proximal rope is pulling medially, the distal rope is pulling laterally. So this view would be called a laterally stressed view because the distal limb relative to the joint is pulled laterally. In the example of this dorsal palmar view, there is widening of the intercarpal joint space medially, and when lateral stress is applied or the, the manus relative to the carpus joint is stressed laterally, the joint opens much wider and one can see a bit of soft tissue swelling here, and one would need to consider any possible ligamentous damage in this patient. Here's just another example of a dorsal plantar view of the tarsus. A medial malleolus avulsion fracture is obvious, but if this patient had any palpable laxity or if there's suspicion that there might be a ligamentous injury as well, a stress study can be done, and in this case, was laterally stressed. So the distal part um, of the limb relative to the tarsal joint is pulled laterally. And here we can see that there is a widened joint space medially between the distal tibia and the medial ridge of the talus. And that widened joint space indicates that there is medial collateral ligament damage present. Contrast radiography is also a nice technique to use for the joints. Iodine-based contrast material is injected into the joint space, and because the iodine is radiopaque, for example here, we can see it and we can highlight structures that we can't normally see. For example, the confines of the joint capsule are highlighted here, as well as intraarticular structures, for example, the biceps tendon is creating a filling defect over here, as it runs um, through the intertubercular groove. We'll cover a little bit more of this when we look at specific joints. It's important to know the anatomy surrounding the joints, and one of these, uh, one of the important things to know is the location and the presence or absence of sesamoids. 
Sesamoids are small bones that occur within tendons where there is a change in direction of the tendon and this results in increased stress on the tendon. So the sesamoid bone is a way to protect the tendon and help, um, help ensure smooth sliding and uh, motion of the joint. There are 68 sesamoids normally in the body and they're seen as homogenous oval osseous structures and they occur in very predictable locations. If there's displacement of a sesamoid, this can indicate pathology, for example, rupture of a muscle or rupture of a tendon. This table just summarizes where we can expect to find sesamoid bones. Within the shoulder, the clavicle can be completely developed, for example, in the cat, or it can be remnant structure in large dogs. Smaller breed dogs tend not to have a clavicle. At the elbow, the supinator muscle, which sits laterally, has a small sesamoid bone within. And at the carpus, the adductor digiti one longus, which sits medially, also has a small sesamoid. There are no sesamoids associated with the hip joints. And within the stifle, the best known sesamoid is probably the patella, which occurs cranially within the tendon of insertion of the quadriceps femoris muscle, the fibella, which sit caudally, and they are in the tendon of origin of the gastrocnevius muscle, and the popliteus sesamoid, which is within the tendon of insertion of the popliteus muscle and sits caudally and laterally um, to the stifle joints. The metacarpophalangeal and the metatarsophalangeal joints also have two sesamoids associated with them. These are the pa paired palmar or plantar sesamoids that occur within the interosseous muscles and a single dorsal sesamoid, which is within the extensor tendons. Here's an example of a mediolateral view of the shoulder of a large breed dog. And this elongated mineralized structure proximally here is a rudimentary clavicle. If in doubt, you can radiograph the opposite joint and you'll see that it should be present there as well. Another structure we can see over here is the small oval mineralized um, osseous structure. And this is consistent with mineralization and the tendon of insertion of the supraspinatus on the major tubercule of the humerus. We'll cover this in a bit more detail when we get to the shoulder joint later. The supinator sesamoid is very important to know the location and know of its presence. Um, it sits laterally to the shoulder joint. On the mediolateral, we can see a structure here indicated by the arrow that superimposes over the joint space. And the reason it's important to know this one very well is that it can be mistaken for a fragmented medial coronoid process. However, the fragmented medial coronoid sits medially and not laterally. And we'll discuss this later when we look at the elbow. Within the carpus, the abduct abductor digiti one longus has a sesamoid indicated here. Within its insertion on the metacarpal one bone and the carpal one bone over here, and it has an oblique orientation across the carpus. In this image, the arrows indicate the, palm, the paired palmar metacarpal sesamoids. They also occur plantarly at the metatarsal phalangeal joints. They are these long triangular shaped bones that occur from digits two to five, and they occur um, and the, the interosseous medius inserts on them on either side abaxially. This image just demonstrates again the paired um, palmar or plantar metacarpophalangeal sesamoid bones. Um, they are at diff different levels because the digits, um, the middle two digits, are their joints are a little bit lower down than the outer two. That's why we can see them at different levels. And then dorsally, there is a sesamoid um, also associated with the metacarpophalangeal or the metatarsophalangeal joints. Within the stifle, the patella is situated cranially. The two fibella, as well as the popliteal sesamoid, are located caudally. The popliteal sesamoid is the smallest one and is often difficult to see on the craniocaudal view. For example, here, it's that little structure sitting there. Whereas the two fibella can be different sizes to each other and they can be at slightly different levels, and this can still be normal. 
Right, so the radiological examination of the joint, um, there's a couple of very important things that we work through when we assess them, and this is what we'll be doing for the rest of the, um, the lecture, working through these before we get to some conditions. So we'll look at the anatomical relationships of the bones that make up the joint. We'll look at any soft tissue swelling and see if we can determine if it is intra or extra articular. We'll look at the joint space to see if it's narrowed or widened. We'll look at the subchondral bone to see if it is more radiolucent or more sclerotic than normal. And then we will look at osteophytes, which are an important sign of degenerate uh, joint disease. And then we will look at calcification in or around the joint. So when we look at the anatomical relationship of the bone, we can um, determine if a, a joint is subluxated or luxated. A subluxation means that there is still some contact between the articular surfaces, and this can be broken down into developmental causes, for example, hip dysplasia. This means that they're not born with it, but it develops over time. Or then acquired subluxations, which is most commonly due to trauma as a result of ligamentous rupture. In luxations, there's no contact left between the articular surfaces. Congenital causes are quite rare, and trauma or acquired is the most common. If we look at the examples over here, this is a craniocaudal view of the shoulder of a dog, and this is a congenital luxation. The reason why it's congenital as opposed to traumatic is if you look at the glenoid surface as well as the humeral head, they're completely malformed, which means that because this was present congenitally or from birth, this joint never had the opportunity to form normally because there was no normal weight bearing on it. If we look at the next image, um, the glenoid um, cavity as well as the humeral head are normally formed. So this is a normal joint from birth, but they are abnormally overlapping. So in this case, we would need an orthogonal view to determine whether this is due to subluxation or luxation. But in this case, it would be acquired and most commonly um, or most likely due to trauma. In the last image, the distal tibia is completely displaced medially and distally um, relative to the, um, at the talus, or more cor correctly, even with um, luxation, we should probably refer to the distal part being displaced relative to the proximal bone. And in this case, again, because the joints are normally formed, they've got a normal shape, this would be traumatic rather than being congenital. To assess soft tissue swelling, there's a few things we can look at. We can look at displacement or distortion of adjacent structures, for example, fascial planes. We can look at an increase in soft tissue opacity over the joint, or we can look at an enlarged joint space. This could be due to any fluid or soft tissue within the joint that can push the joint surfaces apart. The causes of soft tissue swelling could be due to synovial effusion, which might be inflammatory or infectious. It could be non-inflammatory, or it could be hemorrhage, for example, hemoarthrosis. Synovial thickening is often due to inflammation, or in other words, synovitis. Or soft tissue masses, for example, neoplasia of the synovium could also cause soft tissue swelling, but is much less common. So here's an example of how um, of an important area where we can determine whether swelling is intra or extra articular, which in many places is difficult to determine. Within the normal stifle on the left, there is a triangular fat opacity, which is located between the patella ligament and the inside of the joint. This is consistent with the infrapatellar fat pad, which is located between the fibers and synovial layers of the joint capsule. When effusion occurs within the joint, for example, on the right-hand side, there is loss of this triangular fat pad because of the soft tissue opacity, which is quite lobulated in this case, pushing forward and displacing or effacing it. Additionally, there's also displacement of the fascial planes caudally, as well as bulging of the soft tissue, of, of the caudal aspect of the stifle joint. When we look at the joint space, it can either be increased or decreased. Increased joint space could be due to stress, for example, the bones being pulled apart, 
Um, and this is where stress radiography can help um, determine if there has been soft tissue or ligamentous trauma. With skeletal immaturity, the epiphyseal cartilage is still unossified and quite thick. So because it is radiolucent, the joint space just looks wider, but it isn't really. Synovial effusion can increase joint space, um, as can joint laxity. Any joint incongruency where the bones don't fit into each other very well can result in an increased joint space, for example, in the elbow with elbow dysplasia. Thickened cartilage, um, which can be abnormally thickened in a condition called osteochondrosis, can result in an increased joint space. We'll cover that um, a little bit later, but the definition of osteochondrosis is where the cartilage doesn't normally mineralize and therefore it becomes weakened and easily prone to trauma. With any destruction of subcondyl bone, um, the joint space will look wider, not because there's anything within the joint, but rather because as the bone is lost, lost the joint space just looks wider. A decrease in joint space can be due to incorrect centering of the primary beam. If it's not um, parallel to the joint space and it's angled from proximally or distally, it can artific artifactually look narrower. With cartilage attrition or wearing away of the cartilage, the joint space will decrease. And any muscle contracture which pulls the bones closer to each other can also result in, uh, result in a decreased joint space. When we look at the subchondral bone, which is essentially just the bone under the uh, epiphyseal cartilage, we can see that in young patients, it can be normally slightly irregular, especially the major tubercle of the humerus and the distal femoral condyles. I know this is not an equine lecture, but I'll just make a note um, for those that are interested in equines that this is not the case in young foals. Foals should never have irregular subchondral bone. Subchondral bone can also be irregular due to osteochondral fragmentation. So either fragmentation of the cartilage covering the subchondral bone or part of the bone itself. And this has got several causes which we'll go through as we um, go through the rest of the lecture. One of these is osteochondritis desiccans, also sepsis or septic arthritis, avascular necrosis, which we'll cover more in the pelvic limb, and then any inflammatory joint disease. So here's an example um, of what can cause decreased density of subchondral bone. Any septic arthritis will result in lysis or destruction of the subchondral bone. Osteocyst-like lesions are oval to flask-shaped radiolucencies within the subchondral bone, which I'm not going to discuss in much detail here because it's typically an equine condition. And then osteochondrosis, which I've already mentioned is an abnormally thickened cartilage, which is radiolucent and it, um, therefore not vis visible, and it can result in fissuring or destruction um, of the subchondral bone. So this is an example of an oblique view of the elbow. If you look at the medial humeral condyle, there is a concave defect there, as well as a radiolucent zone over there. And this is typical for humeral condyle OCD, which we'll discuss more when we look at the elbow joint in later lectures. Right, so finally we get to osteochondrosis, which is a very important concept to understand in small animals, but as well as equines. The classification system between small animals and equines is a little bit different. I'm not going to go into the equine classification, but just so that you guys don't get confused about it, um, just note that there is a difference and um, be aware of that. So osteochondrosis is a generalized disease process that affects multiple skeletal joints. Certain joints are more commonly affected, and it occurs um, at quite typical anatomical sites. So it's suspected that local ischemia is the initiating factor. Because of this, it leads to failure of the articular cartilage to mineralize. And when the cartilage doesn't mineralize, it becomes thickened and weak, and it becomes prone to damage and tears. So if there's damage and tearing, the synovial fluid from the joint can dissect into the fissures or deep to the cartilage and it can reach the subchondral bone. And this will result in subchondral bone lysis. At the end of the day, this can result in degenerative joint disease. Osteochondritis desiccans or OCD is 
a form of osteochondrosis where a flap of cartilage has dissected away from the underlying um, subchondral attachment and it's formed a free flap that's um, maybe partially attached to the underlying cartilage or completely free. When we looked at when we look at increased density or sclerosis of the subchondral bone, this could be due to cartilage attrition, which is the hallmark of DJD, and this results in um, sclerosis and reactive bone. Infl inflammation or infection can result in the same, as well as any stress or trauma-induced remodeling. This is typically in racing animals, but is much more seen in Courses and that you'll be referred to equine stress-related bone disease for more information on that. All right, the next concept is very important and it'll stay with you for the rest of your veterinary career. That is uh, the definition of osteophytes versus enthesophytes. And these two structures are not the same thing. An osteophyte is an outgrowth of bone at the margin of an articular surface of a synovial joint. It's secondary to many conditions, for example, joint trauma, incongruency of the joint, or secondary um, to hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia. The reason for osteophyte formation is the body is trying to increase the articular surface to stabilize a joint that's not normal. For example, in the image over here, there is a very large osteophyte at the caudal humeral head. And this is an extension of the articular um, surface as the body is trying to stabilize this joint. Osteophytes tend to occur at certain regions. And when we cover specific joints, we'll look at where to look for these in every joint. Right, so an enthesophyte is not the same as an osteophyte. An enthesophyte is a focal proliferation of new bone that forms a spur at an enthesis. An enthesis is where a ligament or a tendon attaches, and thus the new bone formation usually runs in the direction of the insertion of the ligament or the tendon. For example, in the image over here on the right, that is an enthesophyte over there. It's proximally directed, and it is in the direction of the insertion of the um, patella ligament. Enthesophytes can be secondary to trauma or inflammation of a tendon or a ligament, or they may appear intraarticular. And the reason I say it can appear to be intraarticular is because the cranial cruciate ligament is very commonly affected by enthesophytes or enthesopathy. And it is located between the, um, the femur and the tibia, so it appears as if it is intraarticular, but it's not bathed in synovial fluid. It actually has a synovial lining on the outside, which makes it um, separate from the actual joint, although it runs through it. In this image over here, I'll just draw your attention as well to the synovial effusion outlined by the little marker. You can see that lobulated soft tissue opacity swelling, as well as bulging of the caudal stifle joint and um, this is consistent with effusion. So calcification associated with the joints um, can be intraarticular. For example, joint mice are mineralized or non-mineralized cartilage fragments where their origin is abnormal cartilage. And we'll get to this a bit more when we look at specific joints. Menisci, for example, within the um, stifle joint, can mineralize. This is abnormal in the dog. It can occasionally be seen as a normal finding in the cat. And in this radiograph over here, this nicely mineralized meniscus um, is seen in the larger cats. And this was an example of a cheetah, which is normal for that specific species. Other types of calcification within the joint uh, include synovial osteochondromatosis. This is a condition caused by synovial metaplasia and proliferation resulting in multiple intraarticular cartilaginous loose bodies of relatively similar size that may or may not mineralize. If they don't mineralize, it becomes very difficult to see them on radiographs or, or impossible actually. And in those cases, one might need to do a uh, positive contrast orthogram or utilize ultrasound. But in this image, one can see all these oval structures within the caudal confine of the joint 
and also cranially over here within the um, biceps tendon um, sheath, there are multiple of them. Metaplasia just refers to the change of differentiated cell type into another type, which does not normally occur in the tissue that it is found. So within the synovium, one doesn't expect to find um, cartilage or mineralization. Juxtaarticular uh, calcification can also occur, and the most typical example is calcinosa circumscripta, which is a benign condition. This refers to the deposition of calcium at bony prominences most commonly, or in the foot pads or the mouth. It's usually a disease of large dog breeds and occurs in reasonably young animals of less than two years of age. It can look like anything, but typically it has a speckled popcorn-like appearance, and it's not attached to the underlying bone. In this example, one can see that the underlying bone appears quite separate from the structure. Um, an example here at the dorsal plantar as well, but sometimes one needs multiple views to demonstrate this. But this is a very typical appearance. Myositis ossificans is a benign process characterized by heterotopic ossification, usually within large muscles, for example, in the semi ten semen complex in this image over here. Heterotopic means that the bone has formed in the wrong anatomical site. Another condition called myositis ossificans progressiva is a rare inherited disorder characterized by fibros fibrosing and ossification of muscles, tendons, and ligaments of multiple sites. And this is disabling and ultimately fatal. Calcifying tendinopathies or calcifying um, or calcific tendinitis is a form of tendinitis which is a disorder characterized by deposits of hydroxyapatite or crystalline calcium phosphate at any tendon um, of the body and it occurs in fairly common sites. In the forelimb it occurs in the insertion of the infraspinatus or the supraspinatus muscles and in the hindlimb it occurs over the trochanter minor which um, is the insertion of the iliopsoas muscle. It can occur at the insertion of the psoas minor muscle at the iliopictal eminence, and it can occur, as in this example here, um, at the trochanter major where the gluteus muscles inserts. Calcifying tendinopathies are most commonly benign, especially in the hindquarters, but in the forelimbs can compress and irritate adjacent muscles especially the supraspinatus, supraspinatus calcifying tendinopathy, which can result in biceps tenosynovitis. And we'll cover this when we get to that joint. So when we look at degenerative joint disease, it's important um, to understand that it is an end process to many pathologies. So it's generally regarded as a non-inflammatory condition of articular cartilage, resulting from natural aging, trauma, or disease. Many names have been applied to the condition, for example, osteoarthritis. This is most commonly used in people. We more commonly use the term osteoarthrosis or degenerative joint disease. Primary DJD is that which occurs in the diarthrodial joints in which there has been known previous trauma, um, no, sorry, no known previous trauma or disease. This primary condition is best exemplified by the joint changes seen in older animals. So primary DJD is regarded as an aging phenomenon um, in which deterioration of the articular cartilage occurs, leading to the characteristic joint changes. Secondary DJD is a result of some insult to the affected joint. It's a local phenomenon usually rather than a systemic disease, although some systemic disease that affects multiple joints can ultimately lead to DJD. So local insult with the resulting DJD is best exemplified by cranial cruciate ligament rupture, but can also be seen with other conditions such as elbow dysplasia, hip dysplasia, or secondary to septic arthritis as examples. So in the image over here, on the left hand side is the normal joint, and on the right hand side are the seven typical things that we can see with degenerative joint disease. Not all of them may be present at once. So number one is an un uneven subchondral bone surface. This is due to cartilage destruction and therefore also lysis of the subchondral bone. 
Two is enthesopathy. So this is um, new bone formation at ligaments or tendon origins or insertions or also at the capsule of the joint. Articular soft tissue swelling can be seen sometimes. Intra-articular mineralized material, for example, in this case, a um, mineralized meniscus, but also joint mice can also be seen. Number five is an osteophyte, which is the bone um, that originates at the edges of articular, articular margins, trying to stabilize the joints. Um, number six is subchondral sclerosis which can also be seen due to cartilage loss. And then seven is subchondral cystic changes within the bone. This um, is not that common always in small animals. Um, it may more commonly sometimes be seen in horses. So here I've just put in an example of a stifle joint that's affected by DJD or arthrosis on the left, and for you to compare it with a normal joint on the right. So the first thing that we see is an increased soft tissue opacity over the joint, and there is loss of the infrapatellar fat pad. So the cranial part of the fat pad is still there, but the nice triangular caudal part is gone because of the soft tissue opacity within the joint or joint effusion. There's also caudal bulging of the joint capsule, which is not seen on the right-hand side normal image. This joint also has multiple sites of osteophyte and enthesophyte formation. So there's an osteophyte at the distal patella, at the proximal patella, at the proximal and distal trochlear ridges, as well as affecting the distal fabella and the caudal tibial articulation margin. There are also enthesophytes present here. In this area over here, um, which is the typical site of insertion for the cranial cruciate ligament. So be sure that you know of this location as it's very important. For the elbow, um, the normal image is on the right-hand side. The abnormal image affected by DJD is on the left. Over the enconius, there's a lot of osteophyte formation. It's all of this new bone sitting here. There's also osteophytes affecting the proximal radial head over here. There's quite a large bulging one coming out here. And then if you compare the um, trochlear notch of the ulna, or we sometimes call this um, the subtrochlear area, there's marked sclerosis tear compared to the normal bone. So this is typical of DJD of the elbow. Neoplasia of joints is um, relatively uncommon. A malignant synovioma, also better known as the synovial cell sarcoma, can occur here, most commonly in dogs. And it consists of soft tissue swelling around the joint that invades the joint and causes cortical erosion from outside. So in this case, there's multiple lucent cyst-like areas that affect both bones um, associated with the joint. And this is um, an important way to differentiate this from primary bone neoplasia, which tends to not cross the joints. It can also result in local and distant metastases. So lastly, um, when we get to polyarthritis, this means um, it's a term that is used when multiple joints are affected. Typically, um, DJD, which is non-inflammatory, is considered a polyarthritis. Inflammatory polyarthritis is split into infectious or immune-mediated. Infectious causes are uncommon um, in small animals. It affects single joints, usually the larger joints, for example, the stifle, and occurs in larger breed younger dogs. Infectious arthritis is much more commonly seen in the equine and the bovine, and also um, in the young foal. In the young foal, it's typically more multiple joints that are affected due to umbilical infection and lack of colostrum intake for those interested in equines. Immune-mediated um, disease is typically in middle-aged small breed dogs and affects the smaller joints. It can be divided into erosive or non-erosive forms. The erosive form is very similar to um, rheumatoid arthritis that occurs in people and is also referred to as rheumatoid arthritis in the dog. And this is because there's lysis of the subchondral bone of multiple joints. Non-erosive immune-mediated uh, arthritis is usually just seen on radiographs as swelling of multiple joints. It can be idiopathic or it can be secondary to many other causes, some of include, um, which include SLE, drug-induced or neoplasia.
So for infectious arthritis, um, the earliest stage that one can sometimes see is just intraarticular swelling and infusion, which was the case in this Great Dane over here, which only showed swelling of the carpal joint um, after a bite wind to the area. Sometimes an increased joint space can be seen. This is tricky in small animals because we don't radiograph them in a weight-bearing stance. Um, so it's more commonly seen um, in the larger animals. Mild periosteal reaction can sometimes also be seen at the capsule insertion due to pulling and irritation of the capsule. In the advanced stage, there can be decreased or increased joint space. Decreased joint space would be as a result of destruction of the cartilage, which eventually will result to destruction of the subchondral bone, which results in an increased joint space. So there can be, as I've said, subchondral erosions or cyst forming. Um, an example in this image, there's complete destruction um, of this proximal interphalangeal joint, which has also spread to the adjacent bone, and there is um, periosteal reaction present as a result of osteomyelitis. And this is more com common with the chronic stage, where the infection spreads uh, into the adjacent tissue and to the adjacent bone, resulting in epiphyseal destruction and the widened joint space. Periosteal reaction can occur. The joint can luxate or subluxate due to um, loss of the supporting bone, and then it can ankylose or fuse eventually if there's enough periosteal bone forming. So as I've said, um, this is more common in large animals, so they give the best examples. In this case over here, the um, medial digit of the left four is affected. The distal interphalangeal joint shows marked swelling around it. There's an increased joint space over here, and this is because of swelling within the joint, but also because of the destruction of the subchondral bone, which you can compare to the normal um, joint is quite easily seen as this thin sclerotic line. In this case, it's completely destroyed. Additionally, the distal interphalangeal joint is um, subluxated because there is still some cartilage um, or will be some joint coverage, um, but it is displaced, uh, P3 is displaced um, away from where it should be. Here's another example of a goat. Again, marked soft tissue swelling affecting the distal interphalangeal joint. It's very similar to the previous slide. There's loss of the subchondral bone. Um, there's widening of the joint space. And even this bone over here used to be the um, navicular bone, and that's com completely biased. Here's another nice example of a bovine. Severe soft tissue swelling over the carpus. There is gas within the soft tissue swelling. It's sometimes difficult to say if the soft tissue swelling is only within the joint or also around the joint. Um, Extra-articularly, this case is probably a bit of both. Uh, there is irregularity of the subchondral bone of the radiocarpal joint, and there is some periosteal new bone at the distal radius, as well as affecting the dorsal aspects of um, the smaller carpal bones seen on both of these views. All right, lastly, we get to the um, immune-mediated polyarthropathies or arthritis. Rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, again, um, occurs typically in small breed, young to middle-aged dogs, and multiple joints are swollen and affected. It typically is symmetrical and results in ligamentous weakness, which results in the limbs assuming a bent appearance, like in this image. So there can be virus or valgus or hyperextension or hyperflexion. So in this example here, there's soft tissue swelling affecting all of the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joints. There's severe erosion of the subchondral bone and loss of the subchondral bone, and erosion can occur at any synovial attachment. Subluxation also occurs due to um, loss of supports from the bony structures, and this will result in angular um, deformities of the bone. Here's an example of a clinical case that we had last year. This was a six-year-old Maltese with multiple joint swellings and pain and ca lax carpal joints. So these were just some examples of the radiographs that were taken of multiple joints. 
So the left tarsal joint, one can see the soft tissue swelling. And all of the small tarsal bones, as well as the tibiotarsal joints, are irregular and it almost looks like there's all these little punched out lytic areas affecting the bone. The same thing goes for um, the left carpus. There's marked soft tissue swelling over the carpus, as well as this, um, these little punctate lucencies affecting the small carpal bones. The metacarpophalangeal joints are also widened with soft tissue swelling over them. The elbow is also affected, and um, there is some periosteal new bone as a result of the inflammation. With the right stifle, again, marked soft tissue swelling seen, and there's these round radiolucent areas, which is subchondral lysis of the bone, and the tarsus, again, is um, similarly affected, all these multiple round radiolucent areas consistent with subchondral bone lysis, and then marked soft tissue swelling. All right, so this is uh, the end of the lecture on the introduction to the um, to radiology of the joints and we will cover each joint in a little bit more detail as we look at the thoracic and the pelvic joints.